Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege. And um, I'd like to tell you about this little man with a big name. Um, and perhaps we should start there. Uh, Isambard Kingdom Runel. Well, Brunel is his father's family name. Kingdom is his mother's family name. And Isambard, his father was French, so that makes him half French. Uh, Isambard, in fact, is a German forename. And my German is not good, but I do know that Eisen means iron, as in Eisenbahn. And Bart means beard, so beard means man. So Isambard actually means man of iron. And never was any man or woman ever better named. Because um, as your president just described, he built in iron and he built steamships, steam locomotives, and bridges. Um, He's an extraordinary force and a prolific engineer. And, and more than that, uh, a polymath. He didn't specialize. He built in all areas in a time when people were beginning to specialize and, uh, and narrow their field. So uh, that's the name, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He's half French. His father was an American citizen. His father was a royalist in France in the 1780s, which is a very bad time indeed <coughs> to be a royalist in France. Uh, and he fled to America, to the land of the free, on the good ship Liberty. Uh, he arrived in New York and became chief engineer. He, divined, he designed the defenses on Staten Island. He made plans for the first canal in North America from Lake Champlain up to the River Hudson. It's now part of this very busy, thriving Erie Canal system. He also won a competition for the design of the state building uh, in Washington, the Capitol. Um, they didn't build it. Uh, it was too expensive. And this also seems a, a Brunel trait. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the British burnt it down. Um, and the other thing I'd like to do is just apologize <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of Her Majesty's government um, for a very bad thing done a long time ago, uh, which was regrettable. So uh, Isambard King de Brunel, uh, the son of a Frenchman who became an American citizen, uh, <clears throat> but a man who fell in love with an English girl and left America to find her and woo her and marry her. And that's why uh, your loss, that's why we have this little man with this huge name, Isambard Kingdom Brunel and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, little men, big names. <laughs> and both men who changed the world. Uh, both men who change the way we think about cities and buildings. And, um, and the list is impressive. Uh, you've already heard it. The biggest ship in the world three times. Um, the fastest railway in the world and the widest gauge railway in the world. Um, a hundred bridges. But what I'm going to look at this evening is his first project and his last project. Um, and by the way, Frank Lord Wright, uh, not to be outdone, a uh, hundred structures, and of course, the architect of a, um, a new school of architecture, Usonian, and his, um, his monuments, like Brunel's, are everywhere. This is Isambard Kingdom Brunel. You may even recognize the picture, even if you don't recognize the man and his works. Um, this is one of the most famous photographs in the world. And it was taken by uh, a man called Robert Howlett. Uh, and it pictures Brunel, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the son of the Frenchman who became an American. Isambard Kingdom Brunel. By the way, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is uh, 
uh, he hails of Welsh stock, so he's a little bit British as well. Uh, here is Brunel standing in front of the chains that were used to launch his last great ship. And just look for a moment at the size of those chains. These are not chains for railways, though he did build railways. These are chains for launching ships. Each of those links is bigger than the man's head and his stovepipe hat put together. Um, Brunel was only five foot four inches tall, which is why he, um, he favored a stovepipe hat. And uh, if you saw the, uh, the last Olympic Games and the opening ceremony, you will perhaps remember uh, Kenneth Branagh, the actor, and a troupe of men in stovepipe hats opening the ceremonies. Most people thought it was Abraham Lincoln. Um, <laughs> those who didn't thought it was Willy Wonka. <coughs> but it's actually Britain's most famous engineer. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, favored uh, a hat. I don't know, we call it a pork pie hat. Um, but uh, Lloyd Wright was, was not a tall man either. He was, uh, he was five foot seven, no, he'd fight anyone who said he was less than five foot eight. Um, and uh, perhaps that's why they were both driven and so prolific. Um, Brunel writes in his diaries of um, raising himself to look taller when he passed someone by on his horse and admitting in his diary that this was someone he would never see again and would never care for again. Um, Frank Lord Wright was a little more direct. Uh, Frank Lord Wright said that people over six foot tall were a waste of material. <coughs> <laughs> I've since spoken to an American architect who said Frank Lloyd Wright was a brilliant architect, but he didn't know anything about materials. But there we are. Uh, so uh, two very flamboyant men, two very stylish men, two men of fashion, two collectors, two art collectors, um, men with libraries, uh, and patrons of the arts. And um, what I'd like to do now is talk about Isambard Kingdom Brunel's first project and last project. Um, his last project was the world's first ocean liner. And there's a picture of it. It was called the Great Eastern. It was also nicknamed Leviathan or Sea Monster. It was the biggest ship in the world, but he always built the biggest ship in the world. He built the biggest ship in the world three times. This ship was six times bigger than anything else afloat. It was so big it could steam from England to Australia and back again without refueling. This is the Great Eastern. His first project was the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world. And if his last project, the Great Eastern, changed forever uh, patterns of trade and consumption and business, uh, the Great Eastern is sometimes called the ship that changed everything. Um, it's the, uh, the ancestor of the super tanker and the container ship. If his last project changed the shape of the world and the changed the shape of uh, consumption and trade, then his first project changed the shape of our cities. And this is Isambard Kingdom Brunel's first project, aged 19 years, uh, working with his father, the Frenchman, Sir Marc Brunel, who was also an American. And it's the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world. And it, you're looking at um, the oldest structure in the oldest subway, the oldest underground system in the world. This is the tunnel, his first project, aged 19 years. This is the tunnel that changed the shape of our cities. If you think about it, big cities are unthinkable. World cities are impossible without a busy, efficient transport system to move people around the city once they've arrived. This is the tunnel 
um, half completed, half flooded. And this is a picture of the River Thames in Brunel's day. Isambard Kingdom Brunel was born in 1806, and um, he began this project with his father, his father's project, his father's patented method in 1825. And it is a tunnel under the busiest river in the world. What you're looking at is the biggest traffic jam in the world. In Brunel's day, um, there were 3,000 tall masted ships in the River Thames every day. There were 10,000 little boats. The river's so crowded, it took longer to get cargo across the Thames than it took to get cargo across the Atlantic. And the tunnel was designed to move cargo. And perhaps you can see on the picture, um, not in the flooded bit, um, horses and carts moving cargo under the River Thames. Remember, in Brunel's day, the British Empire covered a quarter of the world's land surface. British school children were taught the sun never sets on the British Empire. Uh, a French friend explained to me uh, the sun never sets on the British Empire because God doesn't trust the British in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> but for whatever reason, uh, it's a busy river. The trade of the world comes up and down the Thames. Then they need to get stuff across the river as well as up and down it. And they can't build a conventional bridge because that will stop the tall masted ships. So it's a cargo tunnel. It's now a railway tunnel, but it was designed to move cargo by horse and by cart. And this is where it began. Now, um, if I can draw your attention to the right-hand side of the picture, there's a circular structure. Uh, well, for want of a better way of describing it, this is a gigantic 1,000-ton pastry cutter. For the engineer, it's the world's first caisson. And Brunel was the first person to understand the best way to build below the ground is to build above the ground and sink it. And that huge tower, you're looking at the top of a 50-foot tall tower. That huge tower was built above the ground in an iron ring and sunk under its own weight into the soft earth. The world's first case song. If he'd done nothing else, that would be significant. It was done for the first time in 1825. It is done all over the world ever since as a matter of absolute routine. But look on the left-hand side of the picture, and what you see is a bas-relief sculpture in brick and timber of I'll test this because there may be engineers here. Uh, the world's first TBM. Uh, does anyone know what a TBM is? Tunnel boring machine. It is a tunnel boring machine. This is the world's first tunnel boring machine. These are machines that are honeycombing our cities. These are the machines that built the channel tunnel between England and France. These are the machines that are building uh, the big crossrail tunneling project in London. Uh, it's a tunnel boring machine. It's an actual size model, a sculpture, bas relief in brick and timber of a tunnel boring machine. And there are cages. There are 36 cages. Each of those cages is the size of a man or a miner. In front of each man, there is a wall of planks. The planks are held in by uh, metal poles. Each miner in each cage takes out the top two poles, takes out the plank, digs to four inches, which is about the size of a brick, replaces the plank, replaces the poles, extends them four inches, braces them against the cage, takes out the one below. Digs to four inches, replaces the plank, replaces the pole, takes out the one below. And when he's done, it's incredibly laborious. When he's done the whole of the wall in front of him, and the man in the cage above and below have done the same, 
then those three cages in a row are pushed forwards by screw jacks. Uh, so this is like the jack. I have to check language because, you know, that's what divides us, really, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you're changing the wheel of a car in the uh, trunk, <coughs> you'll have a spare. And uh, the jack is, uh, is pushing the car up so you can change the wheel. Well, these are huge jacks that are pushing these cages forwards, pressing against the wall that has been built. And as they push the cages forwards, bricklayers working behind them build the tunnel walls. And that's the only way you can dig through soft earth. Inside a protective cage, so it doesn't cave in on you. Digging in narrow strips, so the exposure to danger is limited. And as you dig, moving gingerly forwards and building the walls behind you. And that's how they build tunnels today. Uh, they don't have men with short handle spades in cages. They have huge uh, rotating cutting blades. They don't have brick layers. They have precast concrete section lifted into place by huge hydraulic arms. But the principle, I think you can see, is exactly the same. Now, what I've described is how it's meant to work. Unfortunately, the wooden planks in front of the miners kept back the soft earth, but not the water. So the men in these cages are showered with Thames water from the beginning to the end of the shift. That wouldn't be pleasant today. But this is 1825, before Sir Joseph Bazalgette has built the intercepting sewer system, uh, at a time when the English, with their gift for organization, have arranged for the Thames to be their drinking tap and their sewer. So the men are showered with sewage all day long. And they're not just dodging sewage, they're dodging flames from ignited methane because they're digging through what was recently marsh. And when you get marsh, you get marsh gas or methane. The men don't work in the dark. That would be unreasonable. They each have an oil lamp, <laughs> which ignites the methane. <clears throat> So there's sheets of sewage and sheets of flame uh, coming from these cages as these poor creatures itch their way under the River Thames. Um, it is the worst job in the world. Um, but they only work four-hour shifts. They collapse after four hours. And they're replaced by men who are still breathing. And they work <laughs> until they fall over and they're replaced in their turn. And in this way, uh, Brunel, father and son, built the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world. Brunel thought it would take three years. It's only 1,200 feet. But four-inch strips and showering and sewage, it took 18 years. Ooh. 18 years to build this tunnel. It's still in use today. Um, men grew old and died building this extraordinary piece of engineering. It, um, it seems crude, but I just have to remind you that before Brunel, the way they built tunnels was they dug a trench. They put the railway in the trench, they covered the trench over. If you know London, it has the oldest underground railway in the world, uh, the Metropolitan Line, which opened in 1863. But it's a cut and cover railway, cut a trench, put the railway in the trench, cover it over. Well, try doing that under a river. <laughs> and this is why this is an important site. It's an international civil engineering landmark. And um, I, I've thoughtfully brought some story cards um, to help you remember some of the things I'm saying. And this is uh, a description by Peter Ackroyd, the uh, biographer of London and the social historian. And Peter Ackroyd writes, it was a brutal and fearful business, but by these means, Brunel helped to fashion a system that is in use all over the world. The underground or tube system, or subway, 
could not have been created without his precedent. He was indeed a lord of the underworld. <laughs> Brunel's first project. Now this is where it gets a little bit crazy. Uh, the tunnel flooded five times. And the first flood was in May 1827. They are halfway under the river. Uh, nobody's killed, thankfully. But it's a public relations disaster. And Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and there he is pictured foreground with his father. Isambard Kingdom Brunel organizes a PR event. It is the world's first underwater banquet. <laughs> and the great and the good dined underneath the River Thames in November 1827 and ate off silver platter and drank from crystal glass. The gentleman on the right hand side of the painting, now you might recognize him, that's the Duke of Wellington who was a longtime supporter of the Brunel family. And at the end of the table, I hope you can just make out a red platform, and above the red platform, the glint of the instruments of the band of the Coldstream Gods, who played patriotic music for the diners as they ate under the Thames. Now, they're quite noisy above ground. And I don't think anyone here knows or will ever know what it is like to be invited to a dinner party in a cave under a river where a regimental band is built to play patriotic music. <laughs> it's not clear how good the food was either. But as a piece of public relations, it is brilliant. Um, if it's safe enough to have a dinner party down there, it's safe enough for you as potential investors to take up a second subscription of shares and um, give the Brunels the money to resume the works. And um, here's another story. In 1834, another dinner party saved the project, but this time in the pub across the road. <laughs> Here, the fellows of the Royal Society celebrated on Mark Brunel's 65th birthday and founded the Tunnel Club. This is an underwater dinner party, but this isn't the one that produced the money. We'll come to that in a moment. Wonderful piece of fundraising. Sadly, 12 weeks later, the tunnel flooded again, and this time six men died. Um, the... Um, the Thames uh, broke into the workings and um, uh, six men drowned in the darkness. Even those who weren't drowning were struggling and um, it was diagnosed uh, as tunnel sickness and the symptoms that they suffered from were um, skin complaints, uh, respiratory failure, blindness, temporary or permanent, Madness, temporary or permanent, and um, nice detail, this rotting fingernails. So it's not a pleasant job. Um, and people are dying and people are being maimed, uh, but we're British, so <coughs> it shouldn't stop us having a bit of fun. And the, uh, the tunnel was lampooned. Uh, horribly by the press. The, the Times called it the Great Bore, <laughs> which is a good joke um, because they are boring a tunnel under a river for the first time, but it's taking 18 years and we're really quite bored hearing about how far they haven't got. Um, <laughs> the um, uh, contemporary Thomas Hood, a minor poet and editor, wrote an ode to Monsieur Brunel. And uh, I'm not going to recite it, uh, but the, uh, the substance of the poem is, you will never get to the other side of the river, but you're French, so you could put wine racks down there. 
uh, which is a cheap hit. Um, but then that's what newspapers are prone to do. Uh, so this is uh, an amusing little flood. Uh, it's a cartoon by Robert Cruikshank, and if the name's familiar, his brother George Cruikshank was a, a famous illustrator of Charles Dickens. Um, and this is from Isambard Kingdom Brunel's diary. And he writes, the sight and the whole affair was well worth the risk. I would willingly pay my share of the expenses of such a spectacle. Uh, and this is the flood that nearly killed our most famous engineer. Six men died, but Isambard Kingdom Brunel was dragged senseless uh, from the flooded tunnel and sent to Bristol to convalesce. Now, this is a watercolour by his father, Sir Mark Brunel. And we need reminding that engineers can draw and paint. Uh, it's a very charming watercolour, I think, and it shows the tunnel completed. But also, can I point out, it is very different from the picture I showed you of uh, the tunnel uh, cross-section underneath the River Thames. Instead of 3,000 tall-masted ships, you have one single rowing boat. Instead of horses and carts moving cargo, you have pedestrians. Why is it different? It's painted in 1835, and it's painted by Mark Brunel. And you see the figure walking in the left-hand tunnel with the aid of a stick. That's Mark. He's painted himself in his own tunnel in what uh, remains his um, most lasting claim to fame. In the little rowing boat above, you see the man in black. The profile is unmistakable. He's painted his son, Isambard, at high water. Rowing his son, his best friend, William Hawes. And if you read the diaries, they're all the time up and down the river in a little rowing boat. In the tunnel below, pointing, is William's elder brother, Ben Hawes. Ben Hawes became Secretary of State for War and, um, and later Chairman of the Thames Tunnel Company. It was Ben Hawes who sold the tunnel to the railway. And next to Ben, his wife, Sophie Hawes, nay, Brunel, because Ben Hawes married Mark Brunel's daughter. And her nickname, given her by Lord Armstrong, was Brunel in petticoats. Because when she and her little brother were children, the truth is that she showed more aptitude, more ability in things mathematical and technical and engineering than he did. If the man in the rowing boat is Britain's most famous engineer, then the woman in petticoats promised to be a better one. Her misfortune, she's born at a time when women have no such career possibilities. Um, this little watercolour is also um, a scale drawing. It's a watercolour by an engineer. And the different strata are labelled on the back. And just below the tunnel, um, you can perhaps see uh, a strata it's actually quite deep. It's 50 foot deep, and it's quicksand. And that's why the tunnel is so close to the riverbed. It's a scale drawing. If you look at the height of the men in the tunnel and you um, place them between the crown of the tunnel and the riverbed, you'll easily work out that the tunnel is about 14 feet below the River Thames, which is just too close just too close. But in these days, uh, Brunel had none of the uh, devices that modern tunneling engineers have. Um, he, this is before they knew how to pressurize the workings. This is before uh, they knew how to freeze the workings. This is before they discovered, uh, it's called bentonite slurry, and they pump it in the front of gloopy earth, and it makes it all stiff and, uh, and, and easy to dig through. What Brunel had to do was thread his tunnel below the riverbed and above the quicksand. 
And that's why it took so long. And that's why it flooded five times. And this is um, an account by Adam Hart Davis, who's uh, a, a broadcaster and science uh, broadcaster too. He writes, this watercolor is important because the engineer himself painted it. And in those wild Victorian days, few engineers had the time for watercolors. I love it because the painting shows the embodiment of the grandest design of a brilliant engineer. And the tunnel's finished. It took 18 years, but it's finished. Um, this is the tunnel when it opened in 1843. You remember I said that it was designed to move cargo by horse and by cart under the busiest river in the world. Uh, but they ran out of money. They couldn't afford to build the ramps to get the cargo into the cargo tunnel. And uh, what they opened in 1843 was a cargo tunnel that couldn't take cargo. <laughs> now, I don't mean to boast, but I do think uh, we British have a kind of flair for this kind of thing. <clears throat> it opened in 1843 as a very generously proportioned pedestrian tunnel. <laughs> it opened as a visitor attraction. And on the first day, in March 1843, there were 50,000 visitors. On the first day, by the end of the third month, there were a million visitors. Now, that's a lot of people. In 1843, that is half the population of London in the first three months. In 1843, London is the biggest city in the world. And what you're looking at, and I'm choosing my words very carefully, and I'm being very accurate, this is the world's most popular visitor attraction. In its day, the world's most popular. And people came from all over the world because they didn't believe it. Um, in 1843, the idea of walking under a river the size of the Thames is like walking on the moon. And people came to check it out. Not everyone was brave enough to walk through it. Some walked through it, but very briskly. <laughs> it is about the midpoint that people begin to lose their nerve and start to run. <laughs> but if you're really brave, then you stroll under the river and you browse. Do you see there are archways? This is the northbound tunnel. Uh, on the other side of the archways, is the southbound tunnel. There are 60 archways, and in each of those archways, they built a shop. <laughs> this is the world's first underwater shopping arcade. <laughs> and the brave that walked under the Thames bought from the shops. And the shops are selling Thames Tunnel gin flasks, Thames Tunnel pin cushions, Thames Tunnel snuff boxes, Thames Tunnel coffee cups, Thames Tunnel carved horn beakers, Thames Tunnel cigar cutters, Thames Tunnel nursery ware, little plates with a little tunnel in the middle and the alphabet around it for babies. If they'd had baseball caps, they'd have sold them. And it's a very early example of what is technically known as aggressive marketing of site-specific merchandise. <laughs> or tourist tat, as you may have encountered it. Which they sold fast and furious to, I repeat, the millions of visitors. Because they're not just souvenirs. They're trophies. If you were brave enough, 
to walk under the River Thames, you needed proof to take home. And the shops are selling proof. There are 60 shopkeepers explaining to you, the braver you are, the more you buy. <laughs> the people who ran through the tunnel had no time for any purchases whatsoever. You, sir, need an armful of souvenirs, trophies, trophies that say louder than words just how slowly and bravely you walked under the River Thames. For the first time in the history of retail, real men shopped. <laughs> this is the world's first macho shopping arcade. <laughs> and I'm going to read, uh, this is Michael Palin's story. What we shouldn't forget is the grip that the Thames Tunnel had on the popular imagination of the time. A combination of joy, pleasure, wonder, and sheer excitement, which is not dead, and which echoes up from the riverbed to this day. It cost a penny to walk under the River Thames. It cost a penny to get a Thames waterman to row you across the River Thames. It cost a penny to walk over London Bridge with all the arches and all the shops. The business plan calculated on toll from the East India Company and the other shipping agencies moving their goods under the river. But they hadn't the money to build the ramps. So they couldn't earn anything from moving cargo. The shops were there to try and find another source of revenue. They never earned what they would have earned moving cargo, but the shops were quite sex successful and quite busy. Unfortunately, as the weeks went by, what opened as a shining avenue of light under the Thames uh, became, by degrees, a little less shiny and a little less respectable. And people filed down the staircases for all kinds of reasons. The tunnel became a haunt of thieves, cut purses, and what the books demurely described as women no better than they should be. <laughs> and there were all kinds of transactions under the river. And this is bad for the shops. You cannot sell classy goods to classy women in Archway 36 if in Archway 37, though officially untenanted, there is the unmistakable noise of two people getting to know each other. <laughs> and the shops begin to close. And every time a shop closes, there's another dark corner under the river for dark deeds. And the tunnel becomes dangerous. It becomes disgraceful. It becomes libidinous. And the visitor numbers fall off. And there weren't enough visitors when it was crowded. And that's why, in a desperate attempt to find another revenue source, the Thames Tunnel Company organized the world's first underwater fairground. And where the trains now run, there were sword swallowers, fire eaters, magicians, Ethiopian serenaders, Indian dancers, Chinese singers, tightrope walkers. Uh, the sign there uh, on the right-hand side, it says, troop of animals dancing and performing horses. God knows how they got the horses down the staircase. <laughs> a whole section of the tunnel was decorated as a ballroom and a steam-powered musical organ played waltzes under the River Thames. This was the best party in London. And this is a story from, you may not know her, uh, she's a British comedienne, she's called Jo Brand. 
On a cold, wet day in July 1843, Queen Victoria visited with Prince Albert and Lord Byron. One stall sold silk handkerchiefs, and the shopkeeper threw everything into the mud so that the Queen would not dirty her boots. A bit like Walter Raleigh, except this is a Bermondsey trader, not an Elizabethan courtier. For the rest of his life, the trader made a fortune selling handkerchiefs as mudded by Queen Victoria. <laughs> he seemed to have an endless supply. <laughs> and this, uh, this is very important to me. This is the grand entrance hall to the eighth wonder of the world as it was when it opened in 1843. And it is grand, I hope you'll agree. Those sweeping staircases would grace any opera house or theater. But for 150 years, it's been completely inaccessible. And we've opened it up. If you come to London, you can go into this chamber for the first time. And this is a story uh, by Zoe Wanamaker. Um, the, uh, well, she's almost a, a, a national treasure in England, and she is, of course, the daughter of Sam Wanamaker, uh, the talented American director and actor who rebuilt Shakespeare's Globe. Um, what a splendid time to be able to refer to that in Shakespeare's 400th and, um, and at the end of your national Shakespeare competition, uh, I'm speaking to the members of the English Speaking Union. Sorry you didn't win. I, uh... <laughs> uh, but this is Zoe Wanamaker, um, the woman who taught Harry Potter how to fly on a broomstick. By the banks of the Thames, my father, Sam Wanamaker, raised a wooden O and Brunel sunk a brick caisson for the traffic of the stage. So this is Brunel's first project. Uh, it's a very important piece of engineering, um, but it's a rather eccentric story. And um, I'm going to show you a picture of this space uh, in a moment. This is his first project, and it is the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world and it is now the oldest tunnel in the oldest subway system in the world. I want to talk about ships and Brunel's last project. This is Brunel's famous ship. It was built and launched in Bristol. It is the uh, Great Britain, the SS Great Britain, and is the first iron hull propeller driven steamship in the world. But this is his London ship. This is the Great Eastern, the one I showed you at the beginning. This is Leviathan. This is Sea Monster. This is the ship that changed everything. And this is the world's first modern ocean liner. Uh, for three very good reasons. Uh, first, I hope you can see, this has a double hull. For the first time, a ship with a double hull, built in 1858. It has bulkheads or walls from the keel right up to the top deck and uninterrupted walls, unlike the Titanic. It has paddle wheels like Brunel's first ship, which I'll come to in a moment. It also has a propeller and the size of it. They recently tried to build a better propeller for Brunel's ship using uh, computers and all the software at their disposal. And they managed something that was 1% more efficient than the thing Brunel came up with. It's also the first example of marine engineering on an industrial scale. It was called Leviathan, it was called Sea Monster. This ship had 
30,000 plates hammered into its hull. 30,000 plates, only three different sizes. And what we see and immediately recognize, of course, is standardized production. And that's how everything is done today. But Brunel was the first. 30,000 plates, each plate 100 rivets, 3 million rivets hammered into this colossal vessel which was um, built and launched into the River Thames. And this is a famous uh, oil painting of the ship under construction. Uh, because under construction, like the Thames Tunnel, it was a visitor attraction. People paid to come and see it. You see the Royal Barge over here. It was so big, they had to launch it sideways. The Thames isn't wide enough. The Great Eastern is 700, was 700 feet long. That's longer than his railway terminus at Paddington. Here's a man who is building ships bigger than railway terminus. And as I say, it's big enough to steam from England to Australia and back again without refueling. It's also the very first example of travel on ships in inordinate luxury. And people describe the Great Eastern as being four five-star hotels bunched together. Um, this is the beginning of, um, of cruising. This is the beginning of luxury travel um, by those who are lucky and wealthy enough to be able to afford it. And uh, passengers on the Great Eastern were going to travel uh, in, in comfort and style. But for you, perhaps its most important thing was the cable layer. And the Great Eastern laid the first three successful transatlantic cables. It was the only ship big enough to carry that much cable. And because it had paddle wheels as well as a propeller, it had a level of maneuverability which made that difficult business of cable laying easier. You, if you've thought about it, uh, they have an ammeter to check that the current is, uh, is going through the cable and is not broken as they lay the cable. If the ammeter tells them they have to stop, they have to grapple for the cable, pull it up again, cut the cable, splice it to the good end, lay it again. Now all this done in the high seas, that's a very difficult, dangerous business. But with paddle wheels, it becomes much easier. And I should say that when this ship arrived on its maiden voyage to New York, uh, people saw the paddle wheels. This is the biggest ship in the world, remember. This is six times bigger than anything else afloat. This is, this is the biggest ship in the world for half a century. The next ship to go past this in tonnage was the Lusitania. And when it came to New York, they lined Manhattan 50 rows deep to see the biggest ship in the world come up the river. And then when it came up the river, it span on its axis. Now, I'm going to try and do this. Uh, the one paddle wheel goes this way, and the other, yes, OK, so that's how it's done, right? <laughs> so those are paddle wheels, and they're in counter-revolution. And what that means is even if you are the biggest ship in the world, if the paddle wheels are in counter-revolution, then it will spin on its axis. And I have this wonderful image of 50 rows of New Yorker jaws dropping. <laughs> and that's what happened. And of course, if this is the ship that laid the transatlantic cable, then this is the ship that brought the dawning of the age we now live in, which is mass communication. But this is also the ancestor of the supertanker and the container ship, 
We tend to forget this because mostly we fly everywhere. But even today, over 95% of our goods travel by sea. And this is the ship that changed everything. This is the ship that shrank the world. This is the ship that uh, made it possible for us to lead our lives and live our lives and consume as we consume. But this is the ship I want to finish with uh, because this is Brunel's first ship. This is the Great Western. This is the ship that isn't often talked about. And remember, he built the biggest ship in the world three times. <coughs> this is the ship, the first purpose-built steamship to cross the Atlantic. Now, this is extraordinary. Uh, and people thought it couldn't be done. And the argument briefly went something like this. No one has built a steamship to travel those kind of distances before. You'll need more coal. Where are you going to put it? Well, you'll have to build a bigger ship. Well, now the ship's bigger. So you'll need more coal to get across the Atlantic. Where are you going to put it? Well, you'll have to build a bigger ship. Well, now the ship's bigger, and you see the circular argument. And of course, it's not true. Uh, because what Brunel understood that is that the, uh, the resistance through the water is to do with the beam of the ship. It's to do with the cross-section of the ship. You can make it as long as you like, so long as it's strong and its back doesn't break. The capacity for cargo, for coal, is increasing uh, by a cube. Its beam is increasing by a square. And, and this seems obvious to us now, but it wasn't then. And it was Brunel who proved that steamships could cross the Atlantic. And just to remind us, sailing from England to America against the prevailing winds, against the currents, you could take 10 weeks, 10 weeks. But this is a ship powered by steam that'll do it in 10 days. Brunel changed a 10-week journey to a 10-day journey. And his ship, the Great Eastern, that launched, uh, that, that laid the first cables, changed that 10-day journey to a 10-second one. We can flash messages across the Atlantic, one to another, thanks to Brunel's cable and everything that followed. This is a very important ship, and this is a very important engineer. And he's very well known in, um, in England, and I, I hope to make him better known over here. And this is the Brunel Museum. It's a very small museum. It's an international landmark site. It's a very big story, and it's the story of world cities. And this is a sculpture, a bas relief sculpture, made by local children, and it refers to the one I showed you at the very beginning. And this is the underground chamber. Um, the walls are caked with soot from 19th century steam locomotives. And uh, there I am, younger and carefree, before the project began. And this is the plan. These are the landscape gardens. And this is the underground chamber today. Uh, a very sleek, sculptured, minimalist staircase, um, and a party space. <laughs> and what we're doing in this underground chamber, which is open again for the first time in 150 years, is we're organizing entertainment. The acoustics are extraordinary. We've tried opera. It's fabulous. We've tried acoustic guitar, it's wonderful. We've tried klezmer music, uh, Jewish wedding music. It is stunning. You would marry anybody. <laughs> it is a wonderful performance space. And uh, he didn't build it for that, but that's what it is. And that's what he used it for. 
And, and that's where I'd like to finish, except to point out that, of course, um, the hardest thing in doing all this is persuading others that you can do it and getting them to invest. And Brunel was a consummate committee man, apparently uh, addressing committees in Parliament. Uh, he, he won people over who, uh, who were intractable and uh, totally against his projects. Um, and Frank Lloyd Wright uh, had memorable court performances. This is my favorite Frank Lloyd Wright story, um, except the bit about, um, you know, he said that uh, uh, someone tipped America up and all the loose stuff ended up in California. I think that's, any Californians here? I mean, that's a pretty good. Uh, but, but actually, uh, his first court appearance, Frank Lord Wright was asked to, uh, to be a character witness. And uh, the judge said, would you please tell the court uh, your name and your profession? And he said, yes, my name is Frank Lord Wright, and I am the world's greatest living architect. <laughs> and of course, they laughed, as you do. Um, and it was reported everywhere, because this is a public proceeding. And when he got home, uh, his wife said to him, how could you say that? How could you uh, embarrass yourself, uh, me, your wife who loves you, uh, your children who adore you, your friends who admire you, your colleagues who respect you? How could you say such a thing in a public place? And he replied, honey, I was under oath. <laughs> So, uh, two good committee men, two good committee men. Um, and um, I'm, oh, yes, the Thames Tunnel Fancy Fair, which was first held under the River Thames in 1852. And we've recreated it. Um, uh, these are Victorian entertainments on the square outside. And this is the world's first underwater fairground held in 1852 in the Thames Tunnel. Uh, tightrope walkers, sword swallowers, fire eaters, and magicians. The eighth wonder of the world, it was called. The first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world. The first project of a most famous engineer. The birthplace of the tube, the subway. But what I also want to point out is that the underground chamber we have restored access to was inaugurated by can-can dancers. Because, of course, Marc Brunel was a Frenchman, and because uh, it's a good place for delight and entertainment. And that's what we have reverted to now. It's a very small museum. It's a very big story. And part of the story is uh, fanciful delight. Um, just to finish, I have at the back of the room uh, these story cards, which are a dollar each. And this booklet, which tells the story of the Thames Tunnel. And I have in my pocket, and there are others there, um, this, is, um, this is a Victorian fridge magnet. And I also have uh, Victorian erasers, uh, Victorian ballpoint pens, Victorian pencil sharpeners, um, Victorian t-shirts with the famous man with his famous top hat. Um, and they are available from all leading libraries. <laughs> And, and here especially. And they are offered, uh, I need hardly add, not in a tacky commercial way, <laughs> but in an authentic recreation <laughs> of the underwater retail opportunity <laughs> of 1843. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
Yes, if you're the timekeeper, so. All right, we have time for a few questions. Raise your hand. I'll come by with a microphone. And for those live stream viewers, uh, just type in your, post your questions, and I'll read them to Mr. Holtz. Thank you. Great presentation. In the watercolor that Brunel's father did, the different stratas, it looked like there was a limestone strata down about, you know, at the bottom course of the uh, Calcareous tunnel. rock. Yeah. Yeah. W why didn't they build under that and use that as a roof? Uh, I gave a presentation uh, at a symposium uh, held by the British Tunneling Society on the importance of geology in engineering. And um, I showed them this, and I had those sort of questions. Uh, just above the tunnel is a strata of blue clay. And the idea was to get the tunnel below the blue clay. Now, if you know London, you probably know that most of the tube system is north of the river. Half of the city is south of the river. By geological coincidence, North of the river is London clay, south of the river is Bedfordshire sands and gravel. And clay is perfect for tunnelling, and Bedfordshire sand and gravel is a nightmare. And that's what I explained. And the man who followed me was a proper geologist, and he said, this is what people think geology is. And he showed on his presentation a beautifully made sandwich layer cake. And then he said, but this is what geology really is. He said, I made this, and it's a badly made trifle. <laughs> and that's the trouble, that it looks neat, but as you know, anyone with a spade knows, it's not like that at all. Uh, so the survey was inaccurate, and even when they're inaccurate, they lead you into error. You mentioned uh, his activity uh, constructing bridges, and I wonder if there was anything very special in his own innovations in bridge construction. Well, uh, his most famous bridge is Clifton Suspension Bridge, uh, which is the widest span suspension bridge in the world at the time. Uh, he entered it for a competition. The judge, Thomas Telford, said it was difficult, uh, dangerous, and impossible. Okay. Telford said, uh, the longest possible span for a suspension bridge was the one he'd already built. Um, uh, it was a competition. Telford was judging the competition. He said none of the entries were any good. Uh, and Brunel's was dangerous. But he had drawn a little something himself, which would be perfect. So this is a very English competition in which the judge wins. Uh, and thank goodness they, they threw it out and they ran the competition again. And this time Brunel uh, put in three designs. And, um, and if you know the Clifton Suspension Bridge, the dramatic setting, it's a spectacular bridge, you'll know that the bridge is narrower than the span of the gorge. Now, it's not necessary in terms of engineering, but Brunel is simply responding to the anxiety that Telford has created. Um, so I suppose that's his extraordinary bridge, uh, which uh, his fellow engineers said was dangerous and impossible. The sad thing about that bridge, which was his first bridge design, which he always called his first child and his darling, uh, was never built until after he died. And how sad for any man or woman not to see their first child. It was built as a tribute to him by his fellow engineers. But there's a bridge design um, that was done in the teeth of all opposition. Do you know what it is that makes us not do things? It's people telling us we can't do things. And that's a good example of how we can. Robert, a uh, question in the back of the room here. Money's always tight for any century or decade, um, who financed all of this over 18 years? Anyway, thank you. Yeah, 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, good question. Who financed the Thames Tunnel? Well, to begin with, uh, it was well-heeled investors like the Duke of Wellington. Uh, but after the second flood, nobody would invest. And the government came up with the money to finish it. And the government wanted the tunnel finished because they didn't finish the project, remember? It couldn't move cargo by horse and by cart, but they finished the tunnel. And the government put up the money to finish the tunnel because in the 19th century, the narrative was, if you want something built properly, come to Britain. Workshop of the world. We know what we're doing. We'll complete. Well, you cannot have a half-completed tunnel in the capital city of a nation that is pushing this message out to the customers. So the, the government finished the project. Uh, sorry, the government finished the tunnel, but not the project. In the end, uh, after 14 years of uh, tightrope walkers and sword swallowers and fire eaters, the, uh, the tunnel was sold to the railway. And the East London Railway extended the tunnel north and south, and they ran steam trains through the tunnel, which must have been a very grubby, dirty, smelly, uncomfortable journey in a tunnel behind a smokestack. Uh, but the railway extended the tunnel north and south. In 1913, it was electrified, and it is now, as I said at the very beginning, the oldest tunnel in the oldest subway system in the world. So the short answer, uh, deluded investors and government. I suppose the tip here is, uh, the Prime Minister at the time was the Duke of Wellington. And he saw there were military applications. If you need funding, look for the military application. <laughs> A quick question. I can't remember the timing. At the time that the tunnel was begun, had the steam pump for pumping water already been invented? Yes. Uh, yes, and they had steam pumps above the tunnel. Uh, and they were pumping thousands of gallons every day. Uh, what they didn't have was um, air pumps. And uh, if you found any air down there, breathe it quickly before someone else did. Uh. Oh. Robert, we have a question here, at yeah. the middle row. Um, and before we get to it, I just want to say, you know, due to the time, this will be the last question. But you're going to stick around for I'll, I will. a few minutes, so uh, you can... Well, people want souvenirs. Yep, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I just wanted to add, ask, you've told us a lot about his dad. What about his mom? Do we know anything about her? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, his, his mom, uh, Sophia Kingdom, um, accompanied his father uh, to debtor's prison, Marshall Sea. So she was uh, an extraordinary, plucky, brave, splendid example of English motherhood, uh, I think. Uh, but uh, I know no more than that. Um, but I don't think if she'd gone to jail, Sir Mark would have followed her. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.